Hello again, Daryl Davis here with uh, yet another episode in the history of the Gosford Musical Society. Welcome. Now, look, I've spoken in past episodes about venues that we used in the early days. The Valencia Picture Theatre in 1948-60, followed by the magnificent Dwyer Pavilion, which had nothing inside from in the, in the uh, 60s and the early 70s. Now, uh, today, I'm going to outline the use of the Gosford High School Hall, where our productions were held from 1976 to 1988. Now, this started with Hello, Dolly, a big show, and uh, it finished with another big show called Gypsy. In between were 26 other senior productions. Now, it was at that time, too, that the GMS Junior Theater began, so we catered for younger people. This was started by life member Fran Kendall. Um, and it's still going very strong today. It's now called GMS Juniors, and in those days, it was called the uh, GMS uh, Youth Theater. Now, Fran also created, at this time, the GMS Minstrels. Now, this is, uh, uh, they've been performing all over the Central Coast for over 30 years. Um, fabulous group, mainly made up of our senior members. Uh, who entertain everywhere. And if you see how many shows they do per year, it's, it's sort of like 40 to 50. It's just incredible. So the high school hall was the venue, was the best by far. I mean, seats were available because in the old Dwyer Pavilion, everybody had to take seats. They had to come in. The stage had to be built. So this was a, a, a real step up. Um, the seating, however, was not the most comfortable of places to sit. They were high school sort of seats and very hard. Not like when you sit at uh, Laycock Street Community Theater where every seat's fantastic. I believe that about 500 people could actually go there and, and sit during a, uh, a show here. Now I do recall in 1982, uh, I was in the production called Can Can. An opening night came, curtain went up, or actually pulled across in those days. And when we had a look, we opened on the Thursday night, there was probably the first row full and that was it. Oh, the next night, however, uh, the place was packed, 500 people. It was at that time that the society decided to not open on a Thursday night, but to open on Fridays. Now, the seats here, too, were not raked like at Laycock Street. They were all flat. And if you sat behind somebody that was tall, well, you didn't have a great vision. Also, in the wintertime, you were advised to take along a cushion and a blanket. In the summertime, you were advised to bring along uh, a fan and a cushion as well. But it was a proper stage. Now this, is a, this picture here shows a side stage that's built on the, on the right hand side there. Uh, a side stage was used in about every show that we did there because we didn't have a lot of great scenery so they would close the curtains on the main stage, have action on the side stage while they were changing the main stage. You can see the orchestra there, which sat between the audience and the activity on the stage. Now, this is an example of a show called The Mikado, and I think it's a good one. I put in a couple of arrows there, so you can see, firstly, the lighting bar. Uh, the lights, mainly there, they were rented. Um, we bought some lights later on, but they were mainly rented. And you can also see the partition between the audience and the, and the actors. I put this in because this shows that an extension stage to the front was put on as well. And that's me trying to dance in 1984 and no, no, Nanette. That was a dress rehearsal and you can see that the uh, curtains or whatever that to fill up that uh, hole in the stage haven't been placed yet. From memory, I think that was about a meter uh, extension that we had for that. The other great advantage of this stage was it had two tracks for the backdrops. That was something that they didn't have uh, in, in other productions that we had earlier venues. So that was wonderful to have a couple of tracks there. Now this is an example of a backdrop. Now that was from the 1979 MAME that uh, was done on the, at the Gosford High School Hall. You know, when, when you get a backdrop, it's basically a, a very large piece of canvas or calico, and it has to be treated. If you just tried to paint over it, it would bleed through. So they put on some wonderful thing called gloop, which is made from corn flour and, and, and water mixed around, I've done it once, mixed around. You then spread it on your, on your curtain or on your backdrop 
wait for a day or two to dry, and then you can do your painting, which is, which is really good. However, the main thing that's used at the high school hall different were flats. Now, flats are those pieces of set that you can see by this one that are freestanding. Now, that flat is made of uh, very light timber, and then it's covered on the other side would be covered with either very light timber again or MDF or, um, or calico and then painted. And those pieces of, uh, of wood there, the back uh, two pieces, are um, called French legs, and they move. Uh, you can fold them up when you're going to stack it uh, backstage, but they're also held up by sandbags, and that was used a lot in early theater. The sandbags filled uh, with sand, obviously, and placed on there so that they wouldn't uh, topple over. Now, often, we're going to see here that uh, today we use trucks. Now, a truck is simply a piece of set that's on a, a base, and it's got wheels, and it moves on, I guess, like you're trucking on. Uh, and it can be any sort of size you like, but usually a couple meters long by at least, you know, one to uh, one and a half meters uh, wide. Now, this is an example of dressing that truck. That's what that guy's doing, uh, putting in shelving or whatever. And on stage, this is what it looked like. Uh, that was from a scene in Fiddler on the Roof, and that was the Anatevka scene, because that was the village in which they lived. Now, the only problem was at the high school hall, unlike Laycock Street, there's not a great deal of wing space, so that area off stage. And so the trucks had to be maneuvered very gingerly to, to make sure it fit in there. Now, this is an um, example of modern trucks. Now, this was used in uh, Spamalot in 2011, something I am going to talk about in a later episode. And there are two distinct trucks there. One is a castle, as you can see, and that's on wheels. And the other is the wooden rabbit, uh, which <laughs> was sort of like the Trojan horse. And it wheeled in and wheeled out. So that's, uh, that's a real step up uh, now. Now we have here uh, at the high school hall, everyone, when we talk about change rooms, everyone was basically changing under the stage. There was this very large, long room. And it's where the high school people kept their uh, PE equipment and other things. And we used it as a dressing room. The girls on one side and the guys on the other. One thing that was very important was you had to keep the noise down because directly up there was the, was the stage. And if you were too rambunctious, well, the noise would go up and, you know, it would sort of ruin the effect. Now, in those days, there were also a number of people that did makeup. We, we don't do that quite so much today. We might have one or two that, that really work on specialty makeup. But in those days, we had maybe, well, in this picture, there are three people doing makeup, uh, actually applying it. And we had these long tables that had lights on them. And so the actors would sit behind. And here we have two of the, uh, the makeup people that would come and look after wigs and the makeup itself. Um, now, one of the things that was something new for us at, at uh, Gosford High was the use of uh, microphones. You see, when we were at the Valencia and at the showground, there were no microphones. None! So you had to be really, you know, project, as I've said before. You had to enunciate very well. When we got to the high school, they started with the shotgun mics, which were about sort of like so long, and they were on a stand, and there might have been about four or five of them in front of the stage. In a way, it was like a directional mic, so it picked up pretty well. Sometimes they hung them from the, from the uh, rafters as well, uh, depended on the show. However, one of the big changes at the high school hall was the use of radio mics. Now, radio mics, you can see the, the, on the left-hand side, you can see the, the actual pack in those days, and that was carried in a belt or um, a pocket in the back, and then it would come up through and it would be clipped uh, on your shirt. The very early ones were clipped on a shirt or on a skirt. If you've ever seen Singing in the Rain, it reminds me of this. They, they clip it here on the side. And when you started to talk, and that was okay until you moved your head away. And when you did that, it took it away. So that was a, a, an experiment, <laughs> which sometimes it worked. The funny thing was, in the early days of using radio mics, there was in the back, there was a, a, a sound technician, which usually, it's not like today being totally professional. There were people that were spare and they could help out with the sound. And sometimes they would click your mic on, you would walk off stage, and they would forget to click the, the mic off. 
and you would hear these conversations, which don't happen today at Laycock Street, but did happen then. And I can remember one time, somebody even got way up to the back of the stage and was still had the mic on, and boy, the conversation the audience heard was pretty uh, interesting. Now today, the microphones here are placed basically on your, on your face, uh, or if you like, with the, with the lady, just by the hairline. Now, when they were first placed on the face back in the, <laughs> in the mid 80s, they were like a big marble and they stuck on the side and it looked like you had some terrible affliction on your face. So look at now, those little uh, bugs at the end are very thin and, they, and the microphones today are just absolutely, absolutely magnificent. Now what I'd like to do is to tell you about how a show can change in your, in, in your interpretation of it. This was the Mikado in 1966. Those that know the wonderful Kevin Booth, our patron, He's on the far left-hand side. He played the comical role of Coco. But I want you to look at those costumes there and the backdrop behind, that sort of folded curtain, that's all they had. This was at the showground that they did it. When we look at, now, at the high school, look at the difference in the costumes and certainly the makeup. That's Ian Hawkins, who uh, was a, a director and actor and played the Mikado himself in this particular uh, show. Here we have that same show, but, and I put this on it because the immortal Don Craig, who uh, we are filming in the Don Craig room at the moment, Don Craig uh, was on the right-hand side. He played a part called Poobah, uh, which I played the last time we did it in 2010. But again, you have a look at the backdrop there. It's totally different. It's a full-length uh, backdrop, and the costumes were extraordinary. In 1995, the director decided to change the Mikado. Instead of being set in Japan, it was done in England like this in the, in the early 90s by Eric Idle. And they changed it to being set in an English drawing room. Uh, interesting enough, it, right in the center there, the tall guy, is Ben Stevens, who left us to join the Ten Tenors, came back, and when we did Phantom of the Opera, he was the Phantom. But that was a, a novel uh, change to that, that uh, Mikado. Now if we have a look at the last one we did, 2010, 10 years ago, costumes were just outstanding, as was the set. It was uh, at Laycock Street Community Theater, and a wonderful show from beginning to end. And this is, again, one other scene from there. And uh, wow, I, I just I think it's so powerful that. Uh, advertising played a really big part, and this was a float. I know that the picture's not great, but this was a float uh, from the 1980s. They did Guys and Dolls, and they actually took it down through Man Street and, you know, waved at the, at the crowds there and said, come and, buy your, come and buy your tickets. Well, to finish off, the great dream, of course, was to move out of that high school hall and to be involved in the building of the new theater. And there it is, of course, the wonderful Laycock Street Bicentennial Community Theater, which opened in 1988. When we came into that building, that magnificent building, everything changed. Everything changed for us. Well, thank you very much for being with me. I look forward to speaking to the audiences <laughs> in the near future. Daryl Davis here. Thank you very much.